If you believe that, give the Lord praise this morning. That's right. Go ahead and praise the Lord. He's worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord today. Thankful to be in the middle of his presence. Isn't it great to be in the house of God? Amen. It's so good to see all of you here. I'm so thankful that you have come. And we, are certainly want, we certainly want to say to all of the mothers that are in this place today, Happy Mother's Day to you, and we honor you, and we thank you for all that you do for your families and for all of us. Can you welcome all of our mothers to the house of the Lord today? God bless you. Amen. And we're going to go before the Lord. We're going to go before the Lord in prayer. We've had a couple of requests turned in, and we're going to ask the Lord to touch Sue Irvin and also Donna and Peggy Sappington today. Lord, in Jesus' name, we thank you for hearing and answering prayer. God, we pray for these needs today. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to be with them and let your healing virtue flow, God. I pray in the name of the Lord for your goodness and your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen to the book of Joshua, chapter 15. At the end of the service, we do have giveaways and a special gift for every mother, and we're looking forward to giving that to you. Uh, Wednesday night, Urshan College and Corral is going to be here. Looking forward to a good time going to have a great time with this choir from the college, and I hope that you'll do all you can to be here. We're going to have a wonderful time on Wednesday night. It's unusual to have something uh, like this on a Wednesday, but uh, we hope that you'll do all you can to be here, and we're going to have a good time with Urshan College on Wednesday night. Also, of course, remember our services next weekend. Uh, we have grow class at 9 o'clock, but we have difference makers at 845 grow class for all of our new members uh, will be at nine o'clock and then we also have uh, our evening services and looking forward to that we'll have ministry class and all of those kind of good things that go on on Sundays amen this summer we're going to do a very special series and it's uh, called having red letter days and we're going to study the words of Jesus all summer and I know it's going to be a blessing to you we're looking forward to that it's going to be a good time and thankful for that. I am so thankful today that I am in an apostolic church. Amen. Amen. Where we still preach and teach the apostles' doctrine, repentance, water baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. The book of Joshua, chapter number 15, Joshua 15, to all of our graduates. We have several graduates from high school and college that are in our church, and we want you to know, uh, we want to wish all of our graduates uh, congratulations. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate your hard work and your success, and we celebrate your success with you. Joshua 15, if you found it, say amen. amen. Verses 14 through 20. Joshua 15, verses 14 through 20. And Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Shishai, Ahiman and Talmai, the children of Anak. And he went up thence to the inhabitants of Debir, and the name of Debir was Kerjath Sefer. And Caleb said, He that smiteth Kerjath Sefer and taketh it to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, to wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. I'd like to stop there and say, praise the Lord that I got through all those names. Wow. Caleb was easy. But uh, Anak, Shishai, Himon, Talmai, Debir, Kirthjath, Sefer, and Aksa and Othniel and Kenaz, their parents need a good talking to. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, took and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, to wife. And it came to pass as she came unto him that she moved him to ask of her father a field. And she lighted off her ass, and Caleb said unto her, What wouldest thou? Who answered, Give me a blessing. 
for thou hast given me a south land. Look at somebody and tell them south land. Thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah. The word Judah in the Hebrew word means praise. This is the tribe of the children of praise or the children of worship. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah. I want to preach about water for worship. Water for worship. Lord, I thank you, God, for everybody that's gathered here under the sound of my voice today. God, I want to thank you for my mother who taught me to love your ways and to love your word and to love worship. I thank you for my mother that took me to church, God, and taught me how to love you. And God, I thank you for every mother that's here today and those who have gone on from this world, oh God, that we celebrate today. I pray, God, that you bless the memory of those loved ones that have gone on, and I pray that you bless every mother that's here. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to help me to preach to this congregation. I ask you to anoint me to speak your word, and I ask you, Lord Jesus, to anoint every mother and every person that's here with the anointing of the Holy Ghost to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to have your way. And God, I thank you because we're in a place where we have not only the right but the freedom to worship you. And God, I pray that we will get water from the well today and that we'll worship you for it, Lord. And somebody will find that drink of water for their soul. And we ask it, Lord, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. God bless you. Give the Lord a praise as you're being seated. <laughs> Caleb, in this passage of Scripture, is an interesting character. The church that I pastored in Indiana, when we took it, we really had no elders that were very solid in the church. We grew that church, we grew it being in my late 20s and early 30s. We grew it primarily in people in my own age group, the people that I had connections with. So our church, but while it was very lively, and I enjoyed that, our Sunday morning services were the most lively services of the week, and I certainly enjoyed preaching to a lively crowd. It was, it was a, it was, that was a wonderful experience. But we did struggle from the standpoint that we didn't have any elders. We didn't have any older folks that had been through some battles and some troubles and some trials and some wars in life, if you will, that could help our young families know it's going to be all right. We got through it. You can get through it. We made it. You can make it. Caleb, in this passage of Scripture, is an elder among a people that had no elders, Israel had just come through 40 years of sojourning in the wilderness. These 40 years had seen innumerable blessings for the children of Israel. The Bible said that their shoes and their clothes never wore out. Walking through a rough, rugged, barren desert, sharp rocks and thorns and thistles everywhere. Their shoes and clothes never wore out. If for some reason a thorn would grab a thread from their clothes and rip it, by the next morning it was back like it ought to be. If they stepped on a sharp rock that scarred or ripped the side out of their at bottom out of their shoe, by the next morning it was like a brand new shoe again. The Bible said they never wore out. When they got thirsty, they got water from a rock on two different occasions. God fed them with manna from heaven every day. 
most estimates put this crowd at about 2 million people. If you divide it up into families, that's about 500,000 loaves of bread a day. God fed them from heaven every day. It was hot in that desert, that bright sun, but the Bible said that God gave them a pillar of cloud by day. And on those cold desert nights, a pillar of fire by night. But in that same wilderness, there was an entire generation of people that failed to trust in God. When they had the choice, the chance to cross into the promised land, their fear caused them to choose to stay in the wilderness So God decided if they wanted the wilderness more than they wanted the promise, they could stay in the wilderness forever. And that entire generation died in the wilderness. So now all of them but two, Joshua and Caleb, who believed God, and Joshua and Caleb were the only two of that generation that survived the wilderness. So you have to think about it. It's a country. It's a traveling group of people that only have two elders in the entire group, Joshua and Caleb. Caleb is the elder of this group. The older generation died in the wilderness, and Joshua and Caleb just kept going, bearing their friends one by one, bearing their generation one by one while they continue on. Finally, they get back to the Jordan River, And when they get to that place, they look across into that promised land. And Caleb, this old man in a country of young men, crosses the Jordan River in victory just like everybody else did. Crossing into his promised land. So now Caleb stands there on his inheritance. Caleb is given a piece of land because he trusted God. Caleb, in one passage, he says, give me my mountain. Give me my inheritance. Give me my place. Give me what I walked with God for all these years. Give me what I struggled for, what I had faith for when nobody else had faith for it. I trusted God. When everybody else said we couldn't do it, I said we could do it. When everybody said it couldn't be done, I raised my hand and said, God is well able to give us the land. So now give me my mountain. So Joshua gives him that piece of land that Caleb asked for. And when Caleb gets to that piece of land, there's a problem. There's a group of people called the Nephilim. Their ancestry is unique. But they are, to save time, they are giants. One of them, his name is Anak. The word Anak means long-necked. They were a group of giant people. And Anak had three sons. And these three sons just happened to be living on Caleb's mountain. Caleb, he decided, if I believed God could give me my promise 40 years ago, I believe God can give me my promise today. If God promised it to me way back on the other side 40 years ago, God's promises are yea and amen. And I believe that his promise is still true for me today. Amen. I I am really really getting somewhere. I'm getting somewhere today, I think, that's going to make sense on a Mother's Day. You're just going to have to stay with me for a minute. It's sort of, I, don't have a, I don't have a menu to Kate's Cafe today to keep you in, entertained, but, but uh, hopefully we'll still get there. The Bible said that Caleb in Joshua 15 and 14, the Bible said that Caleb drove thence the three sons of Anak, Shishai, Ahiman, and Talmai, the children of Anak. Then... He had this opportunity, and this old man drives out three giants. I'm going to tell you, 
an elder that knows how to pray can do a whole lot in the spirit world. An elder that knows how to war in the spirit can still drive giants out of the land. Every young couple and every young family and every young person in this church ought to thank every elder that has driven the giants out of the land so you can have a place to worship and you can have a place to pray and you can have a place to love God. Thank God for our elders that drove the giants out of the land. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> You're going to have to bear with me. I'm struggling with something today. So this elder drove the giants out of the land. He drove these three giants, but I'm going to tell you that fighting giants is no easy task even for an anointed elder. And now he comes to another place, a village that's known as Debir that at one time was called Kir Jath Sefer. And now after driving out three giants, this old elder needs the help of a younger generation to keep the victory going. I'm going to tell you, it's up to us, the younger generation, to make sure that what these elders fought for doesn't go by the wayside. <laughs> Praise God. It's up to us. The, I'm going to count myself in the younger generation. All the young people here are saying he's way out of his league. And all the older folks said, yeah, he's about right. He's still young. So... I, I, you know, it's like, it's like sound and air conditioning. You can't make everybody happy. You can't make, let me rephrase that, you can't make anybody happy. But this elder, after driving giants out of the land, is now weary, and he needs somebody to help him fight the enemy. And I'm going to tell you, the elders that have worshipped and prayed and loved God and lived holy for all of these years are now looking to younger generations. And they're saying, we need you to help us with these final battles before we cross into the promised land. There's still some battles we're going to have to fight before we make it to the promised land. There's still some victories we're going to have to win before the Lord comes back, folks. And we need our young people to still love holiness and love worship and love one God, and love prayer, and love being faithful, and love giving to the kingdom. Come on, all you young parents and all you young people, you ought to praise God right now. These elders need you to fight with them one more time. We need you to get in the battle with them one more time. There's still battles to be won. Praise God. So now this elder says, this elder says, if I can get somebody to help me fight this enemy. You get to have a bride. And I'm going to tell you, a generation that will help fight an en the enemies when the Lord comes back will be the bride of Christ. But he offers his daughter, Aksa, to the man who will defeat Ker Ker Jath Sefer. Lord, I hope next time I preach you give me words that are easy to say. Please. He says, if you'll help me overcome Kirjath Sefer, you can have Aksa, my daughter, to wife. And there was a man that heard the challenge. His name was Othniel. And Othniel says, I will fight the enemy for the bride. And so Othniel defeats Kirjath Sefer. And he gets Aksa to be his bride. So Aksa now has a husband, Othniel. And she knows that she needs a place to raise her family. I got to have some place where my children can grow. I got to have some place where my children can have homes of their own. So Aksa knew so I need a place for my family. So she goes to her husband, Othniel, and she winks at him, maybe. I don't know. But somehow she convinces him to go to the father and to ask for an inheritance. And Othniel looks at his bride and he says, okay, I'll do it. So Othniel goes to this old man, Caleb, and he says, Caleb, 
father-in-law, Aksa and I need a piece of land for our children. We need a piece of land for our family. And Caleb looks at his son-in-law. And you know, when I, I'm going to guess being the father of two daughters and being a son-in-law, that fathers don't see their son-in-laws just like they see their daughters. Othniel looks in the eyes of, or Caleb looks in the eyes of Othniel and he says, yeah, I'll give you a piece of land. And he gives him a piece of land. It's called, referred to in the Bible as a south land. It's a south land. In the Bible, there are two different words that are translated in, from Hebrew into the word south. One of them means south as a direction, north, south, east, west. The other one means south, but it is the word Negev or Negev. It's sort of like when, uh, when somebody in Chicago tells everybody, I'm going down south. They don't think that they're going to South Chicago. Nobody goes to South Chicago if they don't have to. Praise the Lord. They know that. They know when they say they're going down south, they're thinking about grits and cornbread and biscuits, butter beans and turnip greens. I'm preaching now. Okra and fried catfish. Biscuits and gravy, can I get an amen? amen. Sweet tea. Y'all come back now, you hear? When you say down south, that's what you think about, right? You know, when, when McDonald's decided that they were losing so much business, they had to do something, they created a southern style biscuit. When somebody in New York City off, off orders a southern style biscuit, they don't think it's coming from the South Bronx. They know it's coming from down south, y'all. Because when you say the south in America, it means more than just a direction. It's a whole region of land. When you say going down south, it means something different than just going a little bit south. It means all of the stuff I talked about. Do I need to say it again to get an amen? Y'all, sweet tea, butter beans, okra, fried catfish, biscuits, and gravy. Praise the Lord. It means people wave at you. It means people speak to you. I was in Russia back, back in August, and I'd get up about 5 in the morning, and I'd go walking through St. Petersburg, a city of about 4 or 5 million people. Brother Stan, I smiled at everybody. I'd walk on those busy streets every morning. I'd smile at thousands of people, and, and nobody would smile back at me. I got maybe two smiles the whole time. I'm out there. I'm there for almost two weeks, and I'm walking, and I'm smiling at all these Russian people, and they're not smiling. I'm saying I, I learned how to say hello or howdy or y'all in, in uh, Russian, and they just look at me, and I'm like, what is wrong? So after about five or six days, I went to Brother Stumbo, the missionary. I said, I said Brother Stumbo, I said, I've smiled at literally tens of thousands of people in this city from about 5, 6 o'clock in the morning until our college classes started at 10. I've smiled at thousands of people and not a one of them, well, maybe one or two have smiled back and he laughed. He said, oh, brother. He said, in Russia, the only people that smile are crazy or prostitutes. I'm crazy. Thank you for waking up today. Glad you've joined us on Mother's Day. Can you give all our mothers a good hand? Welcome to church now. But that, you know, in the South, people smile at you. You speak, you pass each other, you say hello or howdy or hotty toddy or whatever they say down a little bit South from here. People are friendly. People, you know, you drive by somebody. They don't have to give you a whole hand wave. They just raise their finger off their steering wheel, and you know what that means. It means howdy, hello. It's 
when you say the south, that's what you think about. Well, in Israel, when you said the south, the word Negev for south means parched or desert, dry. It's a region of desert that borders southern Israel to the, to the Sinai Peninsula. It is the driest, most barren, rocky place in all of Israel. When you, say, when you said in those days in Israel, when you use the word Negev, south, I'm going south, I'm going Negev, it means I'm going to a desert land. I'm in a dry, desert, parched, dry place. I'm in a dry place. And the Bible said that when Caleb looked at his son-in-law, Othniel, and Othniel said, give us some land, he said, okay, I'll give you some land. And just like a good father-in-law does, he said, you can have the south land. So Othniel goes back to Oxa, his wife, and he says, honey, I got good news and I got bad news. Which one you want first? Give me the good news. Your dad gave us some land. Woo, gives him a big kiss on his cheek. He's like, oh, yeah. What's the bad news? He said, um, well, uh, he gave us some land, but, uh, well, um, well, it's a south land, and she's not very happy. She says, get on a camel, son, and she gets on, a, and they go, and she goes back to her dad, and she says, You've given us a south land. How are we supposed to raise our children on a south land? Do you want your grandbabies being thirsty every day? Do you want your grandbabies not being able to get a drink of water when they want it? You're going to give us a south land to raise your grandchildren on? Ain't nobody got time for that. Hallelujah. There's no springs of water on the south land. How am I supposed to raise your grandchildren without a well of water to take them to when they're thirsty? How am I supposed to raise your grandchildren when and they come to me and tell me they're thirsty and I don't have a place to get water for them? Give me a water. Give me a well. Give me, she said, there's no springs of water here. I can't raise my children in a dry place. I can't raise my children in a dry land. I can't raise my children in a south land where there's no wells of water. Give me springs of water for my children to have a drink from. I can't expect my babies to grow up in a dry land thirsty all the time. I can't get water for my babies if there's not a spring or a well. They're going to die of thirst in a, thousand, in a south land where there's no water. This is where a godly mother comes into the equation because the world that we're living in today is a south land. It's a barren place. Sin is rampant in this world. From a spiritual perspective, it is a desert land. A good mother looks at this world and says, I can't raise my babies in this world. A godly mother looks at all the garbage that's on TV and thinks, that's no place for my children. Now I'm preaching. Now you can say amen. A godly mother looks at the music industry and says, that's no place for my babies to grow up. A godly mother looks at the styles of this world revealing immodest and says, that's no place for my babies. You got to give me a well, Father, because I can't raise my children in a dry place like this. It's a desert land. This world is a desert land. It's a perverted. Come on, you know it's right. You know this world and all of its addictions and all of its trappings and all of its perversion is no place to raise a family. You know the culture that we're in today is no place to raise your children. You don't want your babies growing up to be demented in their mind and thinking that wrong is right and that right is wrong. You don't want your baby's mind to think that everything perverted and immoral is the right way. This desert is no place to raise your children. You got to have a water. You got to have a well. Father, give me springs of water for my children to drink from.
This generation of children need mothers who look at the world and know that this world is a desert place and it's no place to raise a family. Children need mothers that will look at their fathers and say, hey, we're going to have to have a better home than this. We'll have to bring God into our home if we're going to raise our children in this desert land. Amen. Thank God that there's mothers all over this church today, all over this church house this morning, who looked at the desert of this world and said, I'm going to raise my children to know God. Give me a well. Give me springs of water. Amen. Amen. We have several... We have several new folks we've baptized in the last few weeks and they've missed the last few services because in that family was born a preemie baby. I went up to the Nick ICU at the Tupelo Hospital earlier this week and I prayed over our newest church member, Camden, as his little tiny hand held the end of my gloved finger. And I prayed over that baby We've just baptized his father in Jesus' name within the last couple of weeks. They're starting out their family. I talked to them. I started out their family to live for God and to serve God because as that baby was coming, they looked at this world and they looked at this desert and they said, that's no place for us to raise this baby. We got to do better than that. And they're doing better than that. And thank God for mothers of brand new babies and elders that have gone on before and out of this pla- out of this world now, but in heaven, that looked at this world and say, we're going to build a church for our families. Give us a spring. Give us some water. Give us some place we can go with our families. And Aksha said, we can't have this desert land for a home. So she goes to her father herself. We still need mothers that know how to go before the heavenly father with petitions and prayers. If you're in a dry place spiritually, dear Lord, don't just stay there, but call out to your heavenly father and say, I need springs of water. I need water from the well for me and for my family. If your marriage is in a dry place and it's been a long time since you felt God in your home, you need to go before your father today and say, Father, my family needs a well today. My home needs springs of water. I'm in a south land, and I need you, Father, to... Come on, I'm preaching to you right now. It's a responsibility of a godly mother to go to the heavenly Father and say, God, let the water from the well come up in my home for my children. God, let there be water in the home. It's been a long time since you felt... If it's been a long time since you felt his power and his presence, go before your father today. If you felt like you've been in a desert, go before the father and say, give me springs of water. Give me springs of water. And in Joshua, I'm almost done preaching. In Joshua 15 and 19, the father, Caleb, answered. She said, she said, give me a blessing. When she answered, he said, what do you want? And she said, give me a blessing. For thou hast given me a south land. Give me also springs of water. I can survive dry places if I know that there's springs of water coming my way. I can survive a season of trouble if I know that there's a well somewhere that I can get to. You gave me a Southland, but now give me also springs of water. Every mother, really everybody in this place ought to say, God, give us springs of water. Give us an outpouring of the water of your spirit on our families today. He gave her, listen, she said, give me springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. Praise God. She said, give me a blessing. Listen, moms and dads, you can't bless your children if you don't have a blessing. You have to have a blessing to give a blessing. You can't give what you don't have. So she said, give me a blessing. Because she couldn't give her children a blessing unless she had a blessing. You need to get a blessing to be a blessing. So go to the Father today and say, Father, I want you to give me a blessing today. Your children need to see you get a blessing. So they know how to get a blessing. Well, praise God. Amen. Give me a blessing. Give me springs of water for my desert land. 
I need water for my family, for my marriage, for my home, for my children. Water for my soul. Give me springs of water. And the Bible said he gave her the upper springs and the nether springs. The upper springs were springs in the high country, springs in the mountaintops, in the hilltops. They were springs in high places. And then he said that he gave them springs in nether. He gave them the nether springs. The word nether in the Hebrew means low or deep. He gave them, he gave them springs on the mountaintops, and he gave them springs in the valleys. God provided, when she asked for him to give springs, God provided her springs on the mountaintops and springs in the valley. If you'll go to your father, he'll give you springs on the mountain when everything's going good and everything's all right and everything's working out. He'll make sure that you have springs of water there. But he also said when you're in the valley and you're low and you're in a place and you, you're in a low place in life, I've still got springs of water even in the low places for you. I've come to tell you that godly mothers know how to get the father to give springs in mountaintops and in valleys. You will have valleys in life. You will have low places in life. But that doesn't mean you have to dry out because you're in the valley. The father said, I'll give you springs in the upper and I'll give you springs in the nether places. I'll give you springs in high places and low places. I'm coming to a close here. The musicians can be making their way forward. We have often preached, and I've mentioned it earlier today. <coughs> that the word Judah in the Hebrew is the word for praise. The tribe of Judah or the tribe of praise was vitally important to the fabric of the society of Israel. Judah was the largest tribe, and if I had more time, and if it wasn't Mother's Day, I'd preach that the largest group of people in the church ought to be the worshipers. That's what I'd preach if I had more time. Judah was the largest tribe. It should not be a minority of the people that really worship. It should be a majority of the people, because Judah should be the largest tribe. Amen. If I had time, I'd preach that. Judah was the first tribe to go into battle. And I would say that the praisers are the ones that break, that win the battles for everybody else. Judah was the tribe of kings. It was from the descendants of Judah that David and Solomon ascended to the throne. It was the tribe of the kings Judah was. It was the, it was the largest. It was the worshipers. They were the warriors and they were the kings. Jesus was from the tribe of Judah. He was called the lion of the tribe of Judah. So not only was it the worshipers and the, the largest group and the warriors and the kings, but it was the king of all kings that came from the tribe of Judah. The Messiah, the Savior. So if Judah doesn't survive the desert land, then there's no victory in battle. There's no kings for the throne. And there's no Messiah and Savior to come and deliver the people. So this mother, Aksa, she may have just been thinking about her immediate situation. But she didn't know that she was fighting for the future of the whole world. She didn't realize that there would be a Sunday morning in 2017 that there would be a mother that desperately needs a drink of water from the well. And that if she doesn't get this spring for her family, that Judah doesn't survive the desert. And then down the line, there's no Joseph and Mary to be born because Judah didn't survive the desert. And if there's no Joseph and Mary to be born, Jesus can't be born. So if she doesn't get water for Judah then there's no salvation for you. So Aksa, this mother, obscure mother, how many of you have recall having heard of her before this morning? One, one hand in the whole place. Obscure, nobody knows about her. Nobody 
really <coughs> knew about her. You probably, you've read her name. You've read this passage, I'm sure. Never, but she never stuck out, really. But if Oxa doesn't go before the Father and say, give me springs of water, then not only is she compromised and her husband and children, but now the hope of the world is compromised. So I'm preaching to every mother that's in this place today and really to every father as well. But listen, moms, you may be able to survive without a good touch from God today. You may not need a spring of water today for yourself, but what about your future? What about your children and grandchildren and unborn posterity? There needs to be an inheritance of water for future worshipers. So I submit that there should be moms here this morning that go to the Father and say, give me springs of water. Because we're in a south land. God, look at the culture that we're raising our families in. God, look at the society that we're forced to raise our boys and girls in. Look at the pressures that they're dealing with through, through social media, internet, television, all the stuff that's in the world. And God, we have to try to get them to think about you with all that other stuff that's going on in their brain. God, we're trying to raise our children to know you in the midst of a, of, a, of a society that has forgotten all about you, God. And God, now you're being mocked openly in society. And God, look, we're in a south land. Give me springs of water because I got to raise my children someplace. I got to be able to take my children somewhere on Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday. That I can let them get a drink of water that they're not going to find out there in the world. So, Father, give me springs of water for worship. Finally, I'm going to close with this Psalm 63. You can stand with me if you want to. Psalm 63, 1 through 5. O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and a thirsty land where no water is. It's a south land, folks. It's a south land. My soul thirsteth for thee. It's a dry and thirsty land where no water is. Anybody agree with me that we're in a dry and thirsty land where no water is? Where no water is. I'm thirsty, God. Here's what I'm thirsty for, to see thy power and thy glory. Give me a well, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. Let me see your power and glory like in the house of God. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Remember, the Bible said that this was the inheritance of Judah. The inherit, this is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Judah. This is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of praise. To see thy power, because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied with morrow and fatness, and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. I've come to tell you today there is water for your worship. There is a well in a south land. As your eyes are closed all over this place, your heads are bowed. I've come to tell you today there is hope for your family. There is hope for your marriage. There's hope for your children. If, you're find, if you find yourself in the Southland today, you find yourself in a dry place, 
This is not only for mothers, this is now for everybody. If you find yourself in a dry place, in a Southland, you find your family needing a touch from heaven and a touch from God, I want to tell you that you can come before the Father today and you can lift your hands to Him and say, give me springs of water. God, I'm in a place where I need to raise my children. I need a well, God. How about it, moms? How about it, dads? How about it, folks? You willing to come to an altar and lift your hands to God and say, I need a south land. I'm in a south land and I need springs of water. God, I need a spring of water for my family. I need a spring of water for my children and my grandchildren. I need a spring of water. I need hope for my family, God. I need hope for my home. I need hope for my children. I need hope. I need hope for my marriage, and I need, give me springs of water, Father. Come on, you can ask him for it. You can call out to God and say, give me springs of water for my home. Pray. The Holy Ghost is moving in this place. 